Quran says so. That's what you call by a self-referencing authority. The Bible is not thus. It has points of verification or the capacity to be falsified if it is not right from sources outside itself. Logically consistent, empirically adequate, and experientially relevant. It makes a difference in how you feel and think and act. There is an existential aspect to it. Even if not central, there is an entailment. It follows naturally. But then what do we do? We take logical consistency, empirical adequacy, experiential relevance. What do we put that test to? To the four questions of origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. But what are the subjects? The subjects are God, reality, knowledge, morality, and humankind, which is theology, metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, and anthropology. Big words. Three, four, five. Three tests, four questions, five disciplines. That's been the apologetic I have followed in my entire ministry. The three tests for truth, the four questions that have to be answered, the five disciplines that have to be understood. What happened in the 1960s goes back actually to the latter part of the, ni- of the, 80, of the 19th century. In 1893, there was a man by the name of Vivekananda who came in to America and began to speak at that time to the American audiences. When Vivekananda started to speak, for the first time, people were sort of in a state of shock. It was the Parliament of World Religions, and uh, there it was in, uh, in 1886, I guess it was. And he was an uninvited speaker, but he was a brilliant man, a brilliant Indian scholar. He was knowledgeable in Western philosophers, Eastern philosophers. He'd read people like Kant and Hume and all of them, and he had understood the early days of Darwinian uh, uh, thinking. He would quote these things right, left, and center. He walked up to the platform, and as he began to speak, his opening words captured the audience there in Chicago. All kinds of scholars had presented what they had done, and then Vivekananda walked up, and he began with, with these words. Brothers and sisters, we who come from the East have sat here on the platform day after day and have been told in a patronizing way that we ought to accept Christianity because Christian nations are the most prosperous. But we look about and we see England, the most prosperous Christian nation in the world, with her foot on the neck of 250 million Asiatics. We look back into history and see that the prosperity began with the invasion of Mexico. Christianity wins its prosperity by cutting the throats of its fellow men. At such a price, the Hindu will not have prosperity. I have sat here today and I've heard the height of intolerance from you. I've heard the creeds of the Muslims applauded when today the Muslim sword is carrying destruction into India. Blood and sword is not for the Hindu whose religion is based on the laws of love. Western spirituality arrived with that speech. Western apologetic with an Eastern worldview. I call it a Western apologetic. The university doors opened wide to Swami Vivekananda. The fascinating thing about what I just read for you is this. Vivekananda used clever logic. He looked at Christianity in the way it was abused, looked at Hinduism without any abuse, and talked about one as being pristine and the other as being horrific. If I had asked Vivekananda, what do you think of the two of, the, of Graham Staines and his boys in a van in our day now, as kerosene is doused on their van in the state of Orissa, and the match is lit, and the van is burning, and the boys inside screaming, and the father with his two sons, and nobody is stopping to help because the Hindu radical is burning them to death. What do you have to say about that, Vivekananda? Do you know what he would say? That's not Hinduism. Then why did you take Christianity with its abuse and call it Christianity? Very clever, very clever logic. But Vivekananda stormed our universities, and in the late 1800s, America's academics were so swayed by him. Go back and see the articles that followed as a result of Vivekananda's talk. And he did the rounds all over. He was a brilliant guy. He knew exactly what he was doing. And then he discipled a handful of people. After Vivekananda came a man who was a contemporary of his, Yogananda. Yogananda had nice curly locked hair, had very angelic looking features, 
And Vyokananda took this one step beyond Vivekananda. What did Yogananda do? He basically made religion syncretistic, that we are all teaching the same thing. He wore an ample cross over his chest, carried on Hindu metaphysics, but would refer to Christ in very patronizing and kind terms, and started to actually say, we are all really teaching the same thing. Attack, say, synchronizing it all in one way or the other, 1960s was ready for Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. The hippie movement had begun. The resistance movement to culture had begun. The Vietnam War was in full sway. Racism was taking its toll. Political authority was being lambasted. Young people had nothing to anchor themselves to and take, take hold. Maharishi Mahesh Yogi came and gave answers of starting to meditate and do all these things in the name of finding a peaceful transcendence that will overcome your soul and take complete control of your life. One of, the, one of uh, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi's uh, disciples was Deepak Chopra. Deepak Chopra followed him as he was a medical doctor. He was not living a good life. He'd got messed up in his own private life and then ultimately gave up his full-time medical practice and started his own uh, yogic disciplines and his breathing disciplines and all this. Even today, he's in the news debating quantum physicists and all of that. So much of it is really vacuous stuff. You know, in quantum theory, they tell you about the subatomic world. If you know, know where it is, you don't know what it's doing. If you know what it's doing, you don't know where it is. That's a very good description for Deepak Chopra's metaphysic. If you know what he's saying, you don't know what he means. If you know what he means, you really don't know what he's trying to say. He'll deny it. Here's the tale that ultimately is told. If you were to take carefully what it is that, these, that the worldview of spirituality then built itself on, it's very simple and very detailed in the way it ultimately gives you the answers to what it is they actually believe. I would like to read for you a couple of pages of what it is they actually believe. The new spiritualists t tell you they're trying to blend the mind, the heart, and the body, and the soul. The mind, the heart, the body, and the soul. Then Elizabeth Lesser, a leading authority in this, says this, spirituality is an attitude of fearlessness, a sense of adventure. It is a way of speaking boldly at the life we have been given here and now on earth as this human being. Who am I? How should I live my life? What happens when I die? Spirituality is nothing more than a brave search for the truth about existence. Nothing more, but nothing less as well. The Buddhists define spirituality as shamatha or a tranquil abiding. And here is one of the ways she recommends. Sit quietly where you are and close your eyes. Feel yourself breathing. Follow the breath on its journey into and out of your body. Sit feeling yourself breathe for a few minutes. Place your hand over your heart. Then put your hand or fingertips lightly on the spot in the center of your rib cage to the right of your physical heart. It is the spot where you can feel and where you are startled and draw your breath sharply inward. Move your hand gently and breathe slowly and softly into that spot until you're focusing intently on what many traditions call the spiritual heart or the heart center. Imagine that spot you are touching is the top of a deep, deep well. Follow your breath into the journey and into the spacious interior of your own heart. Breathe slowly in and out. Let yourself be pulled ever more deeply into the well of your own heart. As you meet throughout uh, thoughts and emotions on the journey, do not push them out. They are part of you, but not all of you. Greet what you find and move on ever deeper and deeper into the well of your spiritual heart. Sit in this state, letting yourself be pulled by your longing into the well of your heart, observing your breath for as long as you feel comfortable and then slowly remove your hand, return to normal breathing, and then open your eyes. Wonderful, isn't it? How nice. You know, I have a friend in Bombay. Actually, his daughter is here. Just flew in two days ago. He told me his brother is a skeptic. And his brother one day said to him, Gul, I've got a perfect plan for you to become a millionaire. Just let your hair grow long. Look like a nice guru. Wear a nice clean kurta pyjama. 
sit in the lotus position. I will bring nine friends. Ten of us will sit in front of you, and you just mutter one sentence at a time, and we'll go, this is beautiful, this is just beautiful. Oh, how, how amazing, how amazing this is. And then next day, we each one will bring ten others, and you mutter a few other one-liners, and we'll all say, oh, wow. Keep going like this, ghoul. Within a year, you will become a millionaire. Have you ever read the writings of Sri Sri Ravi Shankar? He's a billionaire. Have you seen his one-liners? One of his one-liners is, your head must be empty and your, heart, your hand must be full. And he's proved it. <laughs> again and again. Do you know the people from around the world that go to hear Sri Sri Ravi Shankar for this kind of stuff. The Singapore Straits Times had a whole page on his one-liners. Most of it was esoteric nonsense. And the newspaper reporter never heard stuff like this. I sit there and I say to myself, thank God I didn't listen to this when I was on the verge of suicide. I would have jumped off. I said, this is all there is to it. Now you think that's all? Listen, they don't just solve the problem for you. Here is uh, one of the, um, uh, I think this is Marianne Williamson, who's speaking down the road today, by the way. And Marianne Williamson, in one of her books, says, uh, we can solve this world of terrorism problem also. She says, just do this. For a minimum of five minutes every day, meditate the following way. Pray that anyone thinking of committing a terrorist act anywhere in the world will be surrounded by a huge golden egg. The eggshell is made of the spiritual equivalent of titanium. It is impenetrable. Any malevolent, hateful, or violent thought that emanates on the mind of the terrorist cannot get past the confines of the eggshell. Before the violent thought can turn into violent action, it is stopped by the force of this meditative field. Energetically, the terrorist is quarantined. On the inside of the egg, see a shower of golden light pouring from the eggshell into the heart and mind of the terrorist. Pray for your lost brother. To whom? To whom? All of a sudden, from an inward-looking, monistic view, you are all there is. Suddenly she throws in this word, pray. For who? To whom? And then she goes on to say this. See him or her healed by the force of divine love. Divine who? Wrapped in the arms of angels, reminded of who he truly is. Do this five minutes every day and tell everyone you know to do the same thing. We'll quarantine terrorism, my goodness. I don't know why the Mossad and the FBI and the CIA didn't just take an eggshell around and get this whole problem solved. You know how this all actually ultimately ends? It ends very simply with these particular words that I want to read for you and tell you why I think this actually happens. I wrote it out in my book this way. In the beginning, God. God spoke, but that was a long time ago. We wanted certainty. We wanted it now. For this only reason and rationalism would do. But that was not enough. We wanted to see. So we went into the senses and found the empirical. But that's not what we really meant by seeing. We really meant we wanted to feel. So we found a way to generate feeling into the picture. Truth was framed into a scene. But the scene was left open to interpretations because scenes are not absolute. So the story was told as an art form. But the reader still didn't like it because he was not the author. So he read the story while he sat in a reconstructed, a deconstructed cubicle to make of the story whatever he wished. But, that does, but what does one do with the long reach of the empirical? The best way was to find a blend between the empirical and the satirical and end up with God again. The only difference was that God could not be the storyteller and we still needed God. So we became God. That's the trail. If you add to this the Buddhist link, add to this the Taoist link, add to this the Hindu and the Greek link and so on, what you really end up with is no absolute truth, morality is relative, there's no purpose and meaning, language will ever shift and be redefined by the definer who wants to do the defining. So you end up with a postmodern mindset of no truth, no meaning, no certainty. What do we do as Christians? How does Christ come into all of this? 
in a Libyan desert, there was a certain stone found, and this is what it said. I, the captain of the Legion of Rome, serving in the desert of Libya, have learned and pondered this truth in life. Listen very carefully. I, the captain of the Legion of Rome, serving in the desert of Libya, have learned and pondered this truth in life. There are two things to be sought, love and power. No one has both. When Gaddafi was finally cornered, and in that pathetic sign as his body was denuded, what we are told is that he was begging for mercy, that they would not kill him. Love and power, no one has both. He had the power with no love. Now he was pleading for love when somebody else had the power and it did not work for him. That's pretty close to the truth, but it's dead wrong. There is one person in the world who has both love and power, and that is Jesus Christ. It's interesting if you look back in the history of ideas, the problem of evil wasn't really considered such till about the 17th, 18th, 18th century onwards. And of course, it's been trawled out more and more by our new atheist uh, friends these days, being the idea that if there's a God who is all good and is all holy and is all powerful, how could evil exist? Since if he was all good, he wouldn't allow it. If he was all knowing, he would know what's going to happen. He would stop it and so forth. But I think when we look at it, this argument from evil is actually a, an argument that points us to ours also the existence of God. Evil is a departure from the way things ought to be. And if it is a departure from the way things ought to be, that means there is a way things ought to be. There is a design plan for this universe. And the only way you can have a design plan that is good, that is supposed to be perfect, is if God exists. So the, the problem of evil really drives us right back to the existence of God. It does not drive us away from Him when we think about it um, uh, from, you know, from a biblical perspective or even from, from a logical perspective. If God truly has created this world in freedom, then there is always the possibility, if it's truly free, for freedom to be both used in good ways and in evil ways. So we can explain the human problem with evil because there are times when humans perpetrate evil against their own bodies, against one another. They use their freedom, misuse their freedom really, in ways that bring about evil. I myself lost my husband and didn't in a million years see that coming. Um, I would say that um, Everybody who's gone through grief experiences the absence of God, from great, wonderful Christian people like C.S. Lewis to myself to others. I've read in all lots of grief literature that there is that sense that God has abandoned you. So I would say I understand where you're coming from. But I would also say in my own process that as I continue to wrestle with God over it, to argue with God, to pour out my feelings before God, even feelings of, I don't like you anymore, God, I don't love you, how could you do this to me? There is a way in which God is very present in that dark experience, and that's the only way I can describe it. As I clung on, um, and as I reminded myself that all who wander are not lost, um, I, re I was comforted by that and recognized that even in those dark places, God comes near. But even in those places, we can trust that God is with us. That's what the psalmist affirms. And I think ultimately our experience affirms that as we come to see grace being given to us, even in those places that we thought we had gone beyond God's grace because of what we were suffering. But the Christian answer to the problem of evil is that the God who made the world also brought the solution. He wasn't staying detached, as Dorothy Sayers says, didn't stay up in heaven and think, oh, look at them all suffering, or there's pain and sorrow here, and I'm just leaving them to it. The Creator Himself stepped into the equation, bore the penalty, the price of the sorrow, of healing the universe, of forgiving the brokenness, of restoring the creation. And so I feel the Christian answer 
is a good answer. It doesn't exhaust the answer philosophically, but it's better than the alternatives, and I would take it as a, a credible response. My honor to be with you here at Princeton. When I was in Germany. India, very close to Bangladesh. George Washington University. Yeah, South Africa. In Africa. So the global family of humanity is really like what John Wesley would have said, the world is our parish. People are interested in having a spiritual life, but treat faith more like an a la carte menu at a restaurant, choosing what they like and dismissing the rest. Cutting through the hype and seduction is the clear voice of author and apologist Ravi Zacharias in his book, Why Jesus? Rediscovering His Truth in an Age of Mass-Marketed Spirituality. Ravi answers the attraction known as the new spirituality. Billy Graham.